Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Clueless Capitalist, where we help you discover interesting startups, interview founders, and help you become less clueless with angel investing. My name is Razi. And I'm Osman Ahmed, and welcome to The Clueless Capitalist. So in this very special episode of The Clueless Capitalist, we are going to be looking at sustainable seafood. You know that over 2 trillion fish are caught every single year. And if we keep going at this rate, uh, scientists warn that we will degrade the oceans and the planet beyond recognition. And we have to evolve. And that is where Umami Meats comes in. They are pioneering cultivated, not caught seafood, where they are trying to bring us delicious, affordable, and healthy cell-cultured seafood. So in this episode, we have Mihir, who is the founder and CEO of Umami Meats, share with us about cultivated seafood, food security, and how you too can be part of this exciting alternative uh, meat space. So hello, Mihir. Welcome to the episode. Hello. Thanks for having me. Glad to be with you. So the first question I'd like to start with, right, is to find out the origin story of Umami Meats. Like, how did you uh, find yourself in this space and how did you come up with this particular company? Yeah. So I studied biochemistry at university, at University of North Carolina, and I think like most people was on a pre-med or traditional human pharmaceutical therapeutics track and uh, got into startups a bit by accident working on a a, initially a nonprofit venture with a couple of friends at university. And that made me really think strongly that I wanted to work more in startups because of the pace and the scope of things that you could achieve in a shorter time frame. Uh, so I went and joined a venture studio based in Baltimore, Maryland called Early Charm Ventures and sort of started as an analyst, became a venture partner and helped build companies out of universities based on IP that they had created and ended up helping helping to start and run half a dozen companies over three and a half years. And four of those were actually in the aquaculture space, doing things like disease management, feed management, mostly biotech or other kind of deep tech. So I got to know both the seafood industry and realized that it was kind of a compilation of a bunch of really challenging problems that didn't seem to get nearly as much attention as cancer and heart disease and these kind of things. And also, there was sort of a tremendous gap emerging among traditional technology versus expected demand over the next 30 years. And I felt like more people needed to be working on this problem and that I was one of them, that I felt like I had enough knowledge to to identify a couple of key challenges and try to jump in and solve them. So I decided to start Umami Meats with the specific goal of trying to enable a transition in the seafood business to help create sustainable cultivated protein as an option uh, to avoid sort of the arms race that we have with bacteria and viruses in the current farming industry. Uh, Because we're basically inventing a new vaccine and then a new therapeutic, new disease emerges. I think we've all seen a little bit of what this looks like with COVID for humans, but this is an ongoing thing in our food system all the time. And felt like if we could make a leap beyond this core challenge that it would be really transformative for ensuring food security for the long term. Yeah, I have a lot more questions uh, from what you have shared, but I think maybe it'd be good if we could run us through the pitch deck and afterwards we can dive into the rest of the questions. Sure. So I can kind of talk through a bit of the story and as well here about why we're doing what we're doing and, and, and where we're choosing to focus. I think, so cultivated seafood is something that we believe is sustainable, not just in terms of specific species, but also in terms of enabling humans to live where we want to live without having to be located next to specific food sources, which I think has historically been one of the great challenges. And so for us, we view crafting sustainable seafood that's cultivated, not caught as a path to greater security and greater uh, versatility in our food system. Our focus is on a couple of core areas. So one is increasing food safety and sovereignty, decreasing greenhouse emissions and helping to contribute to a zero carbon or net negative, essentially, food system in the longer term, while also protecting biodiversity in our oceans and preventing at-risk species from being driven to extinction. And if we can do these three things, I think we're going to have a transformative impact on the food system because we can make sure that people don't have to worry about things like mercury and microplastics in their food. We can make sure that the ecosystems that are relatively delicate in the oceans maintain balance so that the oceans can continue to be uh, a source of biodiversity, but also 
just a vibrant ecosystem for decades to come. And our process for making this possible, uh, we call cultivation, but it basically starts by taking a sample of tissue from a fish, establishing a stem cell line. And in our case, this is uniquely a single stem cell that can make muscle, fat, and connective tissue. And then we culture those stem cells in a bioreactor, uh, which we call a cultivator. And so we then grow those cells for about two to three weeks and we produce mature muscle and fat in the bioreactor. We can then harvest down the mature muscle and fat and work with partners to produce a variety of structured muscle and seafood products, including fat in some cases. And this is the overall process. So our target is to basically become experts at steps one through four and to work with partners on steps five and six to get these products to retail, to B2B, and also then into the food supply chain. One of the biggest challenges in general, though, with new biotech development is basically that you're, you're relying on blind screening in a very high dimensional space, which means you have dozens of variables you're trying to account for. And each of those dozens of variables has a pretty big operating range. And so we could be screening for a decade uh, and still not know if we have the optimum solution. And one of the biggest issues with this is that now we're adding automation in the last five to 10 years, but automation increases your throughput while still increasing your cost. So it's not actually making you more efficient overall, only on one factor, which is on time spent. And we still run this sort of issue of running random trials automated, but still not knowing if you've actually achieved an absolute maximum best outcome. So our strategy is to combine this traditional process where you use automation, high throughput analysis with a computational layer. And so that computational layer starts by building what we call a digital twin of the cell and of the bioreactor. And this allows us to run models that don't have a black box in the middle. So rather than a traditional model where you see your inputs and your outputs and have no idea what's happening inside and therefore have very limited predictive capabilities, our goal is to actually map the key energy consumption processes within the cell. So we can figure out if we add more or less sugar at certain times of the process, for example, how the cell is going to convert that into waste and how it's going to grow. That allows us to then start running predictive experiments in the cloud. And so running basically machine learning based predictive experiments and coming up with a subset of most likely to succeed variants that we actually run in the lab. And this is a virtuous cycle because the more data we generate in the lab and at scale, the better our computational models become more quickly we're able to get to an optimized commercially ready process and for us uh this is one core part that's sort of an enabling technology this sort of what we call our data platform layer um, enables us to do things like more rapidly optimize the cell line the growth media and the process so so far we have a couple of areas that are quite strong foundational science to build upon the single stem cell that can produce muscle, fat, and connective tissue allows us to use a single scale-up set of reactors instead of multiple. So it reduces overall capex and opex for a facility. We can also turn those into mature muscle and fat in less than a week. And in, in the case of muscle, in three to four days, which allows us to then run the process for a shorter period of time. We're also innovating around how we feed the cells, working with a combination of plant and algae extracts that are bioactive. So we basically keep the functionality of these proteins from the algae and the, and the plants and use them to feed the cells and perform key functions the cells need to survive. Um, and algae that we work with are actually grown and harvested directly out of the ocean. So they're very low cost, they're carbon negative, and they can actually be used to replace some of the fish farming should we become successful enough that we start to take over some of this additional industry. And on the bioprocess side, our focus is on trying new process modes that wouldn't be run in biopharma because you have no real reason to improve upon a 90% profit margin and to try to make sure that these processes become more affordable and more scalable. And this is all done with making cost competitive price parity achievable for cultivated products. So our target is really to bring product to the market out of a pilot plant that's doing one to two tons a month production at about $70 a kilo, which is actually price parity for the first species that we're working on to restaurants. So if we're selling small volume B2B, restaurants for Japanese eel are buying at about 70 to 80. And so if we can price, make it 70 and sell at 80, the margin isn't great, but it's a pilot plant and we're able to be at least break even per unit to start with. But the goal is over the next two years, as we bring these uh, products to full commercial scale, 
to get prices down to 20 to 25 dollars per kilo of edible mass which is on par with a majority of fish species that are consumed today uh, it doesn't get you down to tilapia and carp but those are incredibly uh, cheap fish and so those will not be initial targets for us the biggest targets are species that are hard to farm and being driven extinct because they're already at risk of uh, population collapse due to human consumption changing climate etc usually a combination of factors this sort of naturally creates high price points because you have growing consumer demand for these fish and decreasing supply so naturally there's now a supply gap and the prices are getting driven up and that makes it a really good place for us to start knowing that we're going to start small batch higher higher price point day one and come to mass market over time we're focusing on japanese eel uh the tuna and red snapper and in tuna we're focusing on big eye and yellowfin uh, as our species of focus and this is 50 billion dollar opportunity to do cultivated production for these three species so there's a tremendous amount of opportunity just in a handful of species and there's more than two dozen that are each individually billion dollar markets so seafood is a massive market i think that is often underappreciated how much seafood gets consumed worldwide uh, but we think there's tremendous opportunity to create massive impact focusing on species with these criteria and our business model is to work with suppliers through joint ventures or licensing and supply agreements so essentially we want to be the intel inside the industry enabling traditional food manufacturers and seafood providers to adopt cultivated technologies and launch their own brands using our tech on the back end and so to enable that we're building a standard modular footprint with a software operating layer it helps to make it easier for people who are not 20 year experts in cell culture to actually run these processes. But these companies have tremendous experience in distribution, in branding and in positioning. And we want to take advantage of that because we know that launching new brands is challenging and launching new products when you need to go into 20 or 30 countries, even more so. We want to take advantage of the know-how to avoid making the obvious mistakes there ourselves. And product positioning wise, we've started with a fish ball laksa, which is a sort of local Singaporean dish as our first demo. Uh, we've now actually developed a fish taco, which is a battered fish fillet, as well as Thai style fish cakes. Those are going to be launched at the Singapore International Agri-Food Week in end of October here in Singapore. And from there, we're aiming for a grilled unagi that will demonstrate January of next year to be our first flagship launch product. But after that, moving more and more in the direction of sushi and sashimi grade or thick tuna steaks realizing that those textures and those market segments will be harder to break into just given high consumer expectations and our strategy is actually to get to market in the next two years so we're actively working on scale down today and beginning the process of that pre-pilot scale up i call it a tech demonstration but it's basically a full process being run at a scale down model and in this case scale up would be up to 50 liters and would allow us to actually generate data for a regulatory submission in Singapore and in the US before we invest significant capital into a large scale pilot plant. And that pilot plant would be doing one to two tons with the goal of having that online in Q1 2024 and doing manufacturing by Q2 once it gets commissioned. And the pilot is likely the last facility that we want to own operate ourselves, where we then bring in the partners to do joint development and joint ventures or licensing uh, for anything larger than that to go up from ton scale to kiloton scale for real mass market uh, product development. Uh, and so right now to basically achieve the, the go to market plan that we've put together, our goal is to raise a 6 million seed round to help us complete this pre pilot work. So to actually do the scale up, get the regulatory dossier submitted to Singapore um, and in prep for the US FDA. And to also bring along the first two commercial joint developments that we have now signed as MOUs, but to get those to products that are ready to go to commercial scale production. So our goal for this round is to basically have ready to go commercial process and product and to then be raising to actually build the infrastructure for that in the next in the A round. And of the six million, we've got two million committed in so far and a couple of strategics that are also actively doing due diligence on participation. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. Happy to discuss anything in, in detail here and there, uh, whatever would make more sense. All right, great. I mean, if that um, if that due diligence is complete, um, uh, where does that take you from your two million? So with the corporate strategics, it'll depend on what the ICs commit, but they're 
check size range from the three that we're talking to would get us potentially another one to two on the raise. Yeah. I suppose uh, for me, the, the main question, because this is the type of startup that you typically hear of in the United States, you know, if you look at Impossible, and you look at Eat Just, you look at Oatly, these guys have been around doing their specific thing in their specific vertical, and they've successfully fundraised. And I would say, depending on how you look at it, they've even gone IPO in the uh, North American markets. Why Singapore? Yeah, well, I think it depends on what segments you're looking at. So I think a lot of these companies came to market looking at the vegan or growing kind of flexitarian segments of the market. And in those cases, yeah. US and Europe make the most sense, I think, in terms of maturity of those segments. For us, we're looking at trying to displace premium seafood demand for some of the most in-demand premium aspirational species. And if you look at, if you ask anybody where that market is most premium or largest in the world, you get Japan, South Korea, China, and then ASEAN as your kind of next, and Southeast Asia as your next answers. So for us, seafood is, the industry is built, caught, and then processed, and then sold, starting with Southeast Asia as a hub, and then with, with kind of North and Northeast Asia as the key markets. And so for, for our view, that was kind of one key driver, and the other was regulatory acceptance. And I think Singapore clearly laid down uh, the gauntlet and said, we want to be world leaders in this, and we're willing to create a regulatory sandbox environment that makes that feasible. And that's essential when you're working in a new space to have governments that are willing to work with you to figure out the go-to-market timelines and everything that are reasonable. And I think cultivated is a little bit different from plant-based in that way that you have to get these novel approvals uh, to be able to bring products to market. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned a few things which typically would raise objections, you know, when you talk about stem cells, how would you typically overcome that type of objection from potential investors and consumers? Yeah, I mean, I think our approach is, is different from maybe the stem cell conversation that happened a generation ago or you know, 10, 15 years ago in, in biotech, <laughs> where we were looking at stem cells from embryonic sources or cells that had to be genetically engineered to make them stem cells. And mm -hmm. now we're able to work with stem cell types that we can harvest directly, never have to engineer. They're the natural cells coming out of the fish and yet they're incredibly versatile. And the leaps that have been made in human stem cell therapy have made this possible. And the value judgment I think consumers have to make is what am I willing to continue doing at the risk of species extinction, at the risk of personal health concerns around eating plastics and eating metals and obviously nothing is a trade-off with zero trade-off right otherwise it would it would be a no-brainer for everybody uh, i think the trade-off is that the products may be slightly different from what you're used to but we think still delicious still nutritious and especially day one uh be able to produce steamed grouper that's going to be in a in a skin on head on tail on right Th those are those are applications that are not currently achievable with the technology that we're developing. But if consumers can eat fewer of those and eat a, a version that is just a portion of the muscle, for example, that makes it much easier uh, for them to, to enter this kind of segment. And maybe that's not a big trade-off for a lot of people. And maybe some people say, I need to wait longer until more versatile product types are available. Yeah. No, and uh, I mean, for me, I, I'm an avid seafood eater I, and I love it, but I mean, e even going into the US, I remember buying my typical salmon bagel and having that warning about mercury consumption. And for me, I, the first time I saw it, but it really made me think, okay, maybe I don't want to eat this food anymore. And you brought them both up. Uh, plastics, we're beginning to see more and more uh, microplastics in our oceans, more and more in our food chain, in, in seafood. And there's this mercury contamination and the accumulation of that, which can impact uh, human health. You know, for me, that is a big tick in the box for both of those, really. And, uh, and I see the real value that you're adding here. My, my next question really is around, in spite of these particular um, benefits that you see, if you look at the market today with Impossible, Beyond Meat, Eat Just and Oatly, they've kind of come in with big fanfare and then just kind of dwindled away 
And if I'm a, an investor coming in, uh, how are you going to address that concern? That this isn't going to be just something that's big fanfare and then eventually it's just going to come to nothing. Um, because if you look, if I look at the share price of Oatly, I can't even remember what it started off at, but it's hovering around three or four dollars at the moment. Pretty painful for those people who went in on IPO. Great for those who exited at IPO, but um, yeah. yeah. But for those who came in and, and, and are now sitting, you know, bag holding, how are you going to value yourself now? And how are you going to value yourself um, moving forward? And uh, how are you going to mitigate that risk of, you know, becoming an, uh, you know, high fanfare, but minimal impact? I think it's actually a, a pretty fair conversation to have, right? I mean, I, I, I am incredibly skeptical of trying to build deep tech companies and consumer branded food products because consumer branded food products tend to have a very short rise and fall for, for the vast majority of brands, right? They, they are flash in the pan brands. And usually by the time they end up getting acquired because of their rapid growth, they're already on the downswing. I think the key to robust staying power and value in the food system is something that is B2B, something that actually fits into the existing supply chain that enables large scale transformation. Because if you're trying to do it yourself, I don't know what Oatly's production capacity is, but I have to assume it's not even 1% of global milk production, right? And I think if you want to make a serious dent in an industry, you can't be sub 2% after five years or 10 years um, because there's just no trajectory to getting to meaningful penetration of the market. So one of the reasons that we are building B2B and that we're trying to be very non-egotistical about having our brand, even though we want people to know who we are and what we're doing, I think it doesn't necessarily make sense for us to be the brand on the label um, if it means that we have to take on challenges that are compounding risk of not making it at the level in the market that we want. My view is if I can enable CP and I can enable Maru Hanichiro and I can enable uh, some of the biggest food companies to replace supply structures that are already making their business very difficult. So running a fishing fleet is already incredibly difficult and getting more so because the fish are, populations are shrinking and fuel prices are rising. If I can help them to replace that with something that's better for their economics, better for consumers, and also has a nice environmental benefit, I think that's a winning proposition. I, I think it's really challenging when you're only making things better for consumers and better for the environment, but you can't get it to full scale. That's kind of a missing piece. And I think a lot of companies trying to do this alone run into that problem. Got it. I mean, and, and uh, I think it goes back to your original point about wanting to be the intel inside of the industry. And that would lead me to my next question regarding scale mass production and the partners that you're working with. Is that something that you're already looking at and how how far along are you in, in those kind of discussions about scale and uh, distribution rights? So we are looking at this. Uh, one of the ways we wanted to try to build partners early and keep them interested knowing that I can't fill an MOQ of 10 tons tomorrow is yeah. to work on a co-development basis, right? So we go out to companies and we say, this is what our technology can do and where we think it can go in three to five years. And here's the missing piece as we see it, or in our case, there's sort of two missing pieces. One is upstream. Can we get our inputs at the volumes we'll points we'll need? And downstream, can we turn it into products that consumers care about in, in critical markets? And so we talk to partners on both sides of us, basically, where we envision ourselves sitting in the value chain and have been able to get MOUs and our first joint developments signed, uh, basically with two and now two partners are upstream and three downstream. So I think I can only name one of them publicly today, uh, but most of them will be actually coming. You'll, you'll actually see probably one next week and then a couple in press releases the rest of this year. But as you might imagine, working with marketing departments of large companies can be uh, its own adventure. So I can give you some examples, right? So one of the world's largest ingredients companies, one of the world's largest flavor houses, two companies that manufacture food, OEM basically, for as co-manufacturers. And they all solve different parts of the problem that we need to put together. But I think what we try to remember is the food system is not run by any one person, right? It's, it's a whole series of people involved in different things and by bringing them in very early and trying to do a co-development or trying to do a kind of bring them into the process rather than just saying, here's a product, I need it to get to market at a certain scale. 
our hope is that they have more buy-in and they can help us see around the corners because they do this for a living. And we can, we can maybe try to avoid some of the critical challenges with supply chain bottlenecks and other things just by having some foresight brought into our team earlier. So that, that's more or less the approach we're taking. I think we're, we're seeing good early traction, but now getting it to scale is also a technical challenge, right? And so that's largely something where we are the experts and the partners maybe can't add as much value as they can on the go to market. I mean, um, uh, my, my main burning question, and I think most people are going to be asking this is a blind taste test. I mean, we, we've talked about cultivation and, uh, and the like, but I, I personally bought plant-based the food by accident and not realizing it, cooked it, put it into a sandwich and immediately knew that I wasn't eating uh, seafood. And so for me, I think that's going to be the real crux of, of the matter for consumers. Will it be a significantly different experience to what I have today? And uh, that's my question, really. How close to the original thing are you going to get? Yeah, I mean, I think this is an ongoing exercise, depending on which product you're aiming for. So yeah. initially, our first prototype was a fishbowl. I think we've gotten pretty close on a fishbowl to where most consumers, if we served it, would say it fits in the range that they wouldn't they wouldn't say immediately is this plant based, um, mm -hmm. right? Or is this uh, something else? And we're starting to do like our taste test that we do in October is actually going to be plant based versus cultivated. Uh, to see if people can tell if it's if it's plant based or if it's cultivated or if it's, if it's the real thing, we'll see what the responses to that are in a couple of weeks. Um, but I think it gets harder and harder the more you get close to the thicker cuts and the more you get close to the, the ultra premium of seafood, right? So bluefin, otoro, uh, sashimi grade products, because those consumers are also the most discerning and they're paying quite a lot, so they're also going to be expecting more from the product, right? Uh, and I think. One of the reasons that we have a path to get to that kind of product, as opposed to just putting it out front and saying it's the most expensive, so we want to target this, is that we want to make sure that we're successful with consumers in the right segment first. So a beer battered fish fillet is quite versatile, but I think most people, if they've eaten a beer battered fish in Europe, went from eating battered cod to eating battered haddock to eating maybe even battered halibut and probably noticed a difference, but probably weren't so distraught that one got swapped for another, right? I think the experience was close enough to expectation that they it was okay. And I think that's the sort of thought process we have is we wanted to get it close enough on some aspects where it, you don't notice a difference or you say, actually, it's better in certain aspects and maybe it's not as good on other aspects. But um, with over time, we want to replicate and even exceed the experience. Uh, but I think it's, it's a journey, right? So version one won't be perfect. Version two will get much closer. Version three, we hope is better. And then version four starts to say, what can we do that traditional fish couldn't do? So can I fortify with certain vitamins? Can we fortify with omega-3 in tr fish that are typically lower in omega-3 so that even if you like mild flavored fish, you can still get healthy fish, right? There's all sorts of things that become feasible, but you have to, I think, one, attenuate the, the expectation and provide something familiar first, and then start to look at how you can improve upon the familiar with something that is, viewed as an improvement by the consumer yeah. yeah you know you know umami actually means uh, i want to google this uh before the interview means essence of deliciousness in japanese so i think yeah. uh, eventually we'll get, we'll get to that deliciousness i mean beyond the taste of uh, the product right i mean we've seen during this whole pandemic there's supply chain issues there's food export restrictions and uh governments including the singapore government we're trying to like go towards uh, producing, I think, 30% of our own food by 2030, if I'm not wrong. So, I mean, yes. these kind of alternative uh, proteins or these kind of cultivated proteins growing, uh, and I think they're very interesting to governments to try and grow it in a, in a controlled environment in their own home country. So I'm just curious to know if there are any competitors uh, in terms of what you are doing or are there other, other governments who are saying, hey, Umami Meats, can you guys uh, come and set this up? for us as well. Yeah, I think it is an ongoing conversation that we've had versions of. I think governments are in different stages of understanding, fact finding, and then acceptance. Um, and that tends to be a slower process, particularly for countries that have existing supply, because Singapore has very, very limited local supply. 
uh, of any food, but but fish is actually one of the few things we can produce domestically and do today. I think the conversations typically start out with trying to understand what resources countries have that would make this a good fix or make it challenging. So I think Middle Eastern city states and like Dubai and, and uh, Bahrain and Abu Dhabi are kind of ideal from some points of view because they have abundance of solar energy, ability to put production in, in land that couldn't be arable today and to feed a population that can't otherwise domestically produce these kinds of foods. Um, one of the challenges will be water capacity and, and management because we do have to fill bioreactors with water to, to run them, right? So our conversations now have been in this educational phase, but I think there is serious interest, particularly among land constrained or we say climate constrained countries, looking at cultivated as an option for giving them some degree of ownership of their food system as well. Uh, so Singapore sometimes says food sovereignty, right? But basically you can control how your food system uh, runs in, in the sense that it's not necessarily going to be dependent on exports that are under some other government's uh, decision making, right? And I think the, the comp competitive landscape in seafood is still relatively nascent compared to meat. And if you look at cultivated meat now, there's at least 100 companies in the space globally. Uh, in seafood, there's probably more than a dozen now, but I think you know, at least half of them are very young. I mean, they started in the last 12 months. And I think the focus on branded consumer products is still very prominent amongst most people starting companies in this space um, or their single input suppliers, right? So you'll see people making a feedstock for fish cells or making some particular part of the process. And I think this sort of systems integrator tech enabler role as we see it is, is very much needed, but not being developed yet. I have a number of clueless questions. So I'm going to ask the first one, you know, like when, whenever you watch some of these um, seafood videos or these restaurant videos at, uh, in, in our part of the world, in Asia, they always prioritize the freshness of that seafood. So sometimes you get to see a fish dish where the fish head is still breathing, but the body's already cooked and people are dipping and eating into it, right? So I know like for a regular fish, you chop the head off, that's it, you know, it starts like dying. But then I was wondering like for cultivated seafood, the restaurant have this a small version of this thing there and they can like slice off portion of it and it still goes on living. And I was just wondering how do we uh, keep the freshness that people uh, desire and can we bring it and prolong it uh, in a restaurant kind of a setting? So one, I think there's a couple of different ways that cultivated enables more fresh fish. So number one, when you have cells, as long as you feed them kind of nutrient broth or culture media, we call it, uh, and you feed them enough oxygen, they keep living. Um, so you could, in theory, transport live meat to somebody um, in a, like a small bath of, of media, right? So with an oxygenator or oxygen pump or something, and it would be it would be suitable. Um, I've actually never considered that, but that's something that, that theoretically could be done, right? Technically, it's feasible. Um, but actually, a lot of the flavors in most of the fish we care about come from aging. I mean, you see this in meat, right? You see a lot of steaks and things are, are dry aged. And often for meatier fish like tuna, you see aging as well as a important process to creating a stronger, richer umami and sea flavor. And um, actually the breakdown of some of the components in the cell after uh, they stop kind of growing is what creates that stronger flavor. So one kind of answer is we may not want to have it be so fresh that it, it, it you know, because you want stronger flavors in some dishes, but two, we're, we can produce around the corner. I mean, it won't make sense to put this in, in like the, the World Trade Center, right? It won't make, it makes sense to put this in central downtown, probably because of real estate costs, but you could put this outside of major hubs and allow very short transport chains, which keep product harvested, manufactured, and shipped to a restaurant same day or next day. And I think that's pretty revolutionary compared to the way most fish get caught, frozen, and then transported. And the last thing is, especially when you look at like sashimi and, and sushi restaurants, most countries have regulations in place that mandate freezing or that mandate similar kinds of processes for fish to kill off potential parasites or microbes that might be present from the harvesting process. So we won't have to worry about the parasites that are in the ocean on fish or some of those bacteria. And so the product will stay fresher longer. We haven't tested shelf life yet, but I think we have 
a lot of reasons to expect that it won't go off by the end of the day, right? The way that a lot of fresh fish has to be sold uh, or, or it'll go go bad. So I think the, there's a couple of different aspects to, to maintaining freshness for consumers. Okay. For, for me, what really struck me about the process, this bioreactor that you mentioned, it, it reminds me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it reminds me of the current way that brewing is done for alcohol. Like you'd have, uh, like you, you've got, InBev in in the Netherlands, but they they license their process for Singapore for you know, Tiger Beer and uh, and the likes. And we've got mm-hmm. brewing facilities over in Tuas here in Singapore. Of all the things that we would make locally and domestically, we make beer and and other alcohol. And I'm thinking if you've got that experience of being able to brew alcohol and pretty much every country including the Islamic yeah. countries have capabilities to brew alcohol. Um, it's not too far of a leap to be able to jump from that to having a bioreactor for, for this. Uh, am I right or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, it is slightly more difficult, mainly because yeast are hard to kill and cells are much less so uh, from, from animals. But I think that just adds some complexity to the need to maintain very kind of rigorous process controls and and yeah. part of what we're trying to manage is, is use automation and and kind of sensors true industry 4.0 to make it as easy as brewing beer i mean because at the end of the day um you can keep all the yeast alive in a beer making process and still end up with pretty terrible flavors right so there are still pretty rigorous <laughs> controls involved to make sure that things taste good yeah i think i think there is a lot of not just from beer production, but also from industrial enzyme manufacturing and these kind of things that are used to make yogurts and all the fermented foods that we eat, especially in Asia, there's tons of them, right? I think that expertise, also at the scale that it's being done, is tremendously valuable for this industry to make it easier to spread. And and the biggest thing we have to figure out is how do we help people translate their existing know-how onto this new process? Okay. I mean, in in terms of risks, for your business and how it would scale and grow. Well, what are the key ones that you you immediately uh, have to respond to with with investors? Some of the key risks, so one is definitely regulatory. I mean, Singapore is the only country in the world right now that has an approved product and a, and a public framework published. There are several countries working on this. I mean, I've heard in the Middle East, a couple of countries, we know the US FDA, USDA are actively in process of drafting. Japan has now started and China put it in their five year plan. Right? So there's clearly strong tailwinds on the regulatory side, but timelines yeah. are hard to predict with government uh, processes like this. So trying to figure out the path to get into the larger markets is one key question that often comes up. And I think we try to mitigate that by diversifying, working with partners who could help us get into the right country as soon as that, that becomes a possibility. The second is then the technical scale up risk. Uh, I mean, one is sort of just to really get the right economies of scale, you have to build pretty big facilities that tend to be eight to nine digit plants. And so if you want to build those kind of capital projects and not just use venture to finance them, you need to be able to come up with a robust model that shows your plant can operate profitably, that there's demand for these products and that you can actually let people build confidence in what you're doing such that they're willing to finance it with debt, right? Or finance it with a facility, uh, kind of project-based financing versus uh, business finance for their equity. So that's something that we're actively working on. I think our model lends itself to that incredibly well, because if a, if a company that's Fortune 100, Fortune 500 comes in and says, I want to build a project like this, financing will be available to them that is not available to us. Uh, and yeah. so it makes it much easier to build these projects and to scale quickly. Which I think is important. I mean, to your point about you hear about these things for 10 years and then they don't show up uh, and you can't buy them. I think there is customer fatigue and consumer fatigue saying, I heard this was coming. And then by the time it's available, they've lost interest or thinking about the next thing that they're hearing about. So I think there is importance of realizing that promise quickly enough that you keep the momentum. And that's what we think enabled by brand partners and, and scale up partners, but then also companies that we can partner with to bring capital to the table much more quickly to build facilities in parallel. Once we prove the concept, I could build one at a time, but my partners could all each build one at a time and we could have a dozen up and running in five years. Um, and I think that that helps to really mitigate 
many of the questions that we, we face around how do we actually get this to a meaningful volume. I mean, when it comes to regulatory approval, what exactly are the regulators considering that would give you an approval or not, you know, or a rejection to operate? For, for me, I'm, I'm struggling to see what the particular risks are that a regulator would say have an objection to. Food, food regulation is a little bit different from pharma and other industries. A lot of traditional food regulation is just based on precedent, right? Because we ate things for 5,000 years and we figured, okay, we would have seen anything, even if it was rare, if it occurred in one in a million cases, we would see thousands a year, right? And so we would know that it's a risk. And that's largely how a lot of these things have come into place. Uh, if you look at sort of HACCP, which is the way that the food industry looks at risk profiling, you're basically going through and saying, where do my hazards enter the process and how do I control, have controls? So I think the challenge for food regulators is now marrying some of the knowledge from a pharma process, but applying it to something that goes through your stomach, right? And it goes through your gut. And now yeah. it's not being injected into you. And, and it's being, you're obviously eating much larger volume than like anything that could be given to you as a drug. Uh, so there's just different considerations that have to be taken into account for something they've never seen or paid attention to. But I think there are adjacencies that make it much easier. So I mentioned fermentation based processes for en industrial enzymes. There's tons yeah. of these enzymes like amylases and they're, they're used all across food ingredients prep. So, so the regulars are really looking at how do they adapt what they're doing today to this new process? And is there anything that's new that they might need to account for? I think the novelty comes from processing. So a lot of countries have these ideas around when you look at, you use a different process, even if it's the same product that going in and largely the same product coming out, the new process has to be qualified food safe by its own means. So you could switch from a single screw to a twin screw extruder and have to then prove that that doesn't materially change the food product. In our case, you're changing, you're doing some forming to get an end product. You're doing kind of a maturation process that you don't do because traditional meat is mature coming out of the animal, right? And those are where the questions really lie. Different countries have different areas of concern. Uh, and so it's, it's mostly right now consultative. We just talk them through what we're doing. They come back with questions, potential risks. If it's something that they've thought of that we haven't addressed yet, then we come up with a strategy to address it. And if it's something we already have, then we present our current method and see if they have any concerns about the way that we're going about uh, ensuring safety. And if we need to adjust our process so that it can be harmonized across multiple countries. I mean, I, I would guess that the European Union, once you've got an approval there, all of those countries are open to it, including the adjacent countries that are part of the, uh, you know, the European economic area. Yeah. But for, the, for example, with Asia, you get approval in Singapore, but then you've got another 16 countries to go through. Do you think the risk is that um, also not that high or, or is it a lot more complex here in Asia? Because let's say, for example, yes. Singapore yeah. approves it, then will everyone else just fall in line? Or, or are you going to have to go one by one to every country and, and do it? I mean, this is an ongoing area of, of conversation. Singapore government is thinking about this quite heavily. Actually, during this in International Agri-Free Week, they're holding a regulatory roundtable on cultivated meats and, and seafood in Singapore. And I know at least half a dozen countries that are coming already, plus a number of companies in the space. So I think there's a real understanding that this is going to be important to scale up. But I think most governments don't want to be even even just from a political standpoint, seen following another government's regulation blindly, right? They want to do their own homework. And yeah. so barring kind of a pan-Asia economic alliance that says this alliance level kind of will, will develop a regulatory assessment and that will be used by everyone. I think what we're going to see is 90% of something or 80% of something from a first mover get adapted with some modifications or, or different requests. The other benefit here is if you go through US FDA, FDA approval are typically accelerants for Asian markets, especially those that are not China, right, or Japan, that are sort of large enough markets in their own right to justify somebody coming in and doing a regulatory approval for what they view maybe as a smaller market. So I think, for example, in Thailand, in uh, Vietnam, and several countries like this, you see US FDA adjacent kind of frameworks pop up relatively quickly after an FDA framework comes into being. And that enables rapid expansion on that basis. So our view is 
combination of Singapore plus US FDA. And if those processes are closely aligned, we'll see a lot of alignment broadly. If those processes are quite far apart, then it's going to be potentially everyone picks their own version of something in the middle. Uh, and, and we end up with something much more complicated. Okay, cool. I was curious to know about one of the risks about achieving that, that taste, you know, or achieving like in terms of being able to produce what you have envisioned, that's definitely going to be happening, right? It's not like we are still in an experimenting kind of a phase. Some of the products have already been out and taste tested, right? So the fish fillet, uh, taco, uh, we've done internal tastings now for several months. We've done a, a couple of external sort of collaborations to help evolve that and accelerate that. And now we're going to be doing our first official external tasting of it at the end of the month. So our goal is is that we we can validate that the work that we've done and the internal panel and the partner panel that we have working on this have hit the mark. Yeah, I mean, I think that some of the things are aspirational today, right? Definitely. So if I say sashimi, aspirational today, right? Tuna steak, also aspirational today. But there are certain products that I think we'll be ready to bring to market on the timeline we've laid out. Um, okay, sounds good. And then um, let's uh, move on towards uh, the questions around the, the fundraising. So we have already, uh, you've already mentioned it earlier. I was wanted to know, like, what is the current valuation of uh, Umami? Yeah, so I think we haven't set a valuation on this round because uh, right now we're sort of uh, working on a, a lead that would set a price, but everything else that we're doing is on a kind of a convertible note basis. Um, and, but I would say, you know, we're looking at something in the sort of like 20% dilution range on this, uh, 6 million raise. And that's, that's roughly the ballpark that we're, we're targeting. So that, that sort of gives a bit of a view of, of where we're, where we're looking at. Okay. And, uh, what is the minimum ticket uh, to participate in this round? Uh, so the minimum would be a 10K ticket. So ju just to clarify on that $10,000 ticket, we, we talked about this previously. That's going into an SPV that you've got arranged, correct? Yeah. Yes. So if, if somebody wanted to come directly in on, onto your cap table, what would that minimum ticket be? I think that would likely be about 100K. Um, yeah. Based on, I have to just, I have to run numbers and it would depend on how many of those we get. Uh, Singapore, unfortunately, has a relatively small number of people you could have on your cap table uh, yeah. before you might get converted into a public entity. So that's something we just have to manage on a, on a kind of ongoing basis. Uh, we're looking at around, a, I would say about 30 million valuation and a minimum ticket to be directly on the cap table of 100,000. We're talking US or Singapore dollars, because that's uh, uh, US. Uh, Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Uh, and if you're in on the SPV, minimum ticket is around ten thousand US. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And, and and depending on interest, we can potentially look at lowering that. I think for now, that's just makes it easier for us to manage the SPV. Um, but I know like we're we're using AngelList right as a SPV manager, so their minimum I think is one one K. Logistically, it's feasible to to lower that, but I think structurally right now we're aiming at ten. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. And what is the uh, what is the potential exit? I mean, this is an exciting space. Governments are looking at it. VCs are looking at it. Um, I mean, alternative means are uh, getting a lot more interest. So, I mean, this is hypothetical, obviously. But what what do you think of the uh, potential exit, or where where do you hope to bring Umami? Like, uh, do you hope to IPO? Do you hope to get acquired by one of these big players? They're doing JVs with. Yeah. I think, I mean, in food, traditionally, M&A is much, much more common than IPO. Uh, I think glut of IPOs in the recent 15 year boom cycle maybe has, has belied that tradition a little bit, but um, I think incorporating ourselves into a much larger company, particularly companies that can can go and scale or are willing to maintain the business model of tech enablement for a broader industry would be exciting to us. Um, and. The key question to us is if we can get to stable, recurring, growing revenue, then IPOs start to become interesting. But I think the key thing here is is reliable, repeatable revenue, right? I think that's where a lot of food companies have struggled because they get one-time purchases. And so share prices look like yo-yo charts. <laughs> so I think our business model lends itself to it's the equivalent of MRR because you know, we're, we're on a, looking at a royalty sort of business, but that's going to be the key determining factor as to whether, when, when we start to consider maybe IPO versus the M&A that's in our minds today. Okay, 
uh, you've got this taste test happening in October this month. Uh, you've yeah. got the Unagi due uh, in January 2023 or first quarter of 2023. Yeah. Yeah. What would success look like for those particular milestones? What are you looking at to trigger off the next stage of, uh, or tr trigger the success factor for the next round of um, of activity for your business? Yeah, I mean, I think the focus for the taste test. So number one is like prototypes, not market ready products, right? So for October, the goal is to really show concrete progress that we can that we can incorporate the cells into real products, and yeah. to showcase how we've been working with these these partners. So we'll be able to announce who those partners are and to say this is what we've produced with them, and everything in this is able to be scaled today on existing supply chain, and that's kind of. Goal number one is to really highlight and also for the partners to see that we're we understand the phasing of phase one as a prototype phase two is optimization and then three is let's go commercial with it. Um, for us, being able to bring in corporate partners, additional partners downstream for distribution for product code development or upstream for some of the core inputs that we need to source is is one of the key goals for doing this tasting. And I think about half the attendees are going to be kind of strategics. So um those are those are really the core targets for now is is expanding the supply chain that's within our network and then bringing on the right investors to help us scale okay to be honest this is like one of the most exciting um startups that i've come across where it's deep tech in a space which is really going to make massive impact i think it's one of the few that i've seen that that impacts so many you know, sustainable development goals all in one go. And uh, and for me, if, if you're looking to make an impact, you know, investing in a company like this is definitely going to do it. We're all concerned about the, the state of our oceans, um, the state of overfishing. And we're also looking at, you know, food security as a, everybody's concerned about it, not just governments, but people are concerned. Where is the food going to arrive from? Um, even just simple stuff like the UK exiting the European Union and what's going to happen to our supply chains and food if we're not domestically producing them. And uh, and I think this is a great, great way to kind of give governments confidence that they can sustainably deploy industry that will feed their populations and, and keep them from going hungry. So I, I think this is this is really fascinating and really important. If anything, yeah, I'd be surprised that this doesn't go really, really far um, just because of the nature of the multiple facets of the industry angle, the government angle that, that it addresses. I think it's great. Yeah, so thank you, Bihar, for joining us uh, for this particular episode of The Clueless Capitalist. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. It was a fun conversation. Thank you. And if you enjoyed this episode, please remember to like, comment and subscribe and see you on the next episode.